and we are recording. Great. Silencing my phone. Hello to everyone that's uh, trickling in. Uh, welcome. We'll we'll get started here in uh, just a minute as uh, as folks uh, log in and, and we'll get things moving. I want to say welcome to the folks who just joined. Uh, we're going to give it about another minute, and uh, then we will we'll get the presentation started. All right, we'll go ahead and dive in. I want to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. My name is Dan and with SCORE, Re uh, Score Maine. We provide uh, small business mentoring and one-on-one uh, -on -one mentoring. And we also do workshops similar to this one that we partnered with Fork Food Lab on, where we bring small business education for free to small business owners here in Maine. And I want to say thank you to Fork Food Lab and, and Corinne at Fork Food Lab for partnering with us on uh, today's workshop food truck and mobile units to brick and mortar, uh, how to get started in different resources that are available. Uh, this workshop is recorded and will be sent out afterwards with the slides that have wonderful links and information on them. And uh, with that, I will pass it on over to Corinne to get started. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. It's always a pleasure to work with you on these workshops. We love what SCORE does over at Fork Food Lab, and we really appreciate all the work that you put into organizing these. So thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Corinne Tompkins. I am the, I just got a title change over at Fork Food Lab. I'm the Deputy Executive Director. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but you can find me over at Fork Food Lab. We just relocated to South Portland on June 30th of this past summer. Um, you may be familiar with us, excuse me, uh, with our previous location in West Bayside on the peninsula in Portland. And uh, we operated there in a 5,200 square foot facility over two floors. And what we did there is we were Maine's first food business incubator and shared commissary kitchen. During the pandemic, we experienced a massive demand and an upward trajectory of people interested in opening food businesses. And that entire period became the justification for our relocation to South Portland. So what we did was we bought a 42,000 square foot uh, warehousing building. It used to be um, the WEX headquarters and data processing center on Darling Avenue. And we're in the middle of a three part build out over here. Phase one is completed. And that's what we're doing here right now. That's our manufacturing space. By moving to South Portland, we've been able to elevate the uh, circumstances, the facility, the equipment, um, the services, and more importantly, provide more volume for people to be able to not only start a business, but actually have it have space to grow. 
So that's what I do over in South Portland with Fork Food Lab. Maybe you've heard of us, maybe you haven't. Um, part of the reason why we're presenting this information to you today is because we are a spot that's actually really critical for mobile food units and food trucks to do legal food business and vending in Maine. All mobile food units need a legal commissary kitchen. So even though on a food truck or in a trailer or something like that, you are cooking, you know, inside of the moving vehicle, um, it'll be parked, you know, but even though you're cooking inside of that food truck or trailer, food trucks still need access to a lot of other amenities and services um, that your food truck just don't, it just doesn't have it. The food truck is, is limited to some degrees. So we are um, a commissary kitchen, a legal commissary kitchen for mobile food units in Southern Maine. Um, we actually have a lot of different types of people that use us as a commissary kitchen, largely from Southern Maine, but also from other parts of Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and people that come up with Florida, uh, from Florida seasonally with their food trucks too. So we'll talk more about that and I'll get the slideshow started. Sorry, give me one second, it's loading. Great. So in this workshop today, we're gonna cover what exactly is a food truck or a mobile unit, why open a food truck or a mobile food unit, food trucks versus trailers and carts, an order of operations for getting things started, what challenges that you should probably consider before opening a mobile food unit and figuring out if opening a mobile food unit is actually right for you. Uh, also, we're going to cover where you can sell food in Maine with a mobile unit, what the legal requirements are. And then the last slide is a bunch of really helpful links and resources that will get sent to you after this workshop is over. So what exactly is a mobile food unit? In Maine, the mobile food unit phrase is an umbrella term for food service vehicles. So underneath that umbrella, we have food trucks, food trailers, bike carts, push carts, hot dog carts, and there's so many other different types of mobile food units. For example, we have a member at Fork Food Lab, one of the businesses that uh, uses our kitchen as a legal commissary, is a gentleman that built like a 20 foot smoker on a trailer. So that's also considered a mobile food unit. So that's why it says include but not limited to, you know, these predominant types of mobile food units that you see um, definitely in the Portland area. I see a lot more food trucks and trailers as we get into more rural parts of Maine. All mobile food units are considered mobile restaurants and may require some of the same operational components as restaurants. So even though you're um, outside and you don't have a dining room for people to sit down at, you don't have bathrooms for people to use, you still need things like a three-bay sink for a wash, rinse, sanitize cycle for dish washing. Uh, you still need to have refrigeration and frozen storage if your menu requires those things. Equipment, commercial equipment. Um, so there's a lot of components that are really similar between a brick and mortar restaurant and a food truck. Um, just kind of designed a little differently. So why are people interested in really even opening food trucks and mobile food units? For any for anyone who comes from a professional food background, or maybe you're making a uh, career change, we saw a lot of that during the pandemic. There's, you know, really no wrong answer. But if someone has a solid product, or has a really great menu, or is a talented chef, or wants to bring um, a culturally specific um, food item to a new community, 
a food truck or a mobile food unit has a lower barrier to entry for actually introducing the community and your future customers to your menu and your products. And by, you know, the lower barrier to entry really has a lot to do with removing the fact that you're not in a physical space. You're in a much smaller, much more compact space. And what it ultimately leads to is having overall costs that are significantly lower than opening a restaurant. And I think we all kind of know this, but just to reiterate, you know, opening a restaurant can get very, very expensive. Things that we've noticed in the Portland area over the past couple of years is that spaces that were zoned for restaurants and then a lease expires or the original business closed and it becomes available for a other food menu or restaurant to enter into that space, there's sometimes you're not grandfathered in based on the zoning that was previously um, attached to the space that you're interested in with the restaurant. So what we've been seeing is an increased cost and the increased volume of the build out before you even invite people into your establishment, there's a lot of bureaucratic steps that you need to go through depending on where you are. And sometimes that includes adding another entrance as a fire exit, depending on how many people you want inside of your restaurant or needing to upgrade your plumbing and things like that. So when you even start before you open the doors with added costs for the build out, you know, things can really start to get very expensive. Typically also in your brick and mortar world, you're going to be signing three, five, maybe 10 year leases sometimes, and those can increase year over year. So there's just a lot that goes into the liability, getting the licensing. Maybe you're going to consider getting a liquor license with a brick and mortar restaurant. That's a whole other separate world of storage and design, et cetera. So there's a lot of components that go into opening a restaurant generally. By having a food truck, you're eliminating about 80% of those things. Um, so it really does ultimately lower the entry level cost for bringing a menu and having a food service establishment. Also, considering your costs are so much lower than being in a restaurant somewhere, um, your annual gross revenue, and we see this all the time, can really compete with the restaurant industry. We see food trucks that gross across the country hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars a year, depending on how many food trucks your business ultimately ends up with. Uh, we see some really popular food truck franchises like Cousins. Um, we're, we have a member at Fork Food Lab, V Bon Me, who has a second truck being built out right now. So, you know, just like restaurants franchise and end up with satellite locations, a lot of people do the same thing with food trucks and you can generate a pretty decent amount of money through, through that type of food service. Choosing the right mobile unit for you. What we've seen over the past decade, basically, maybe 15 years or so, is a massive increase in interest, demand, um, and, you know, especially through the connection of like the food network and things like that, we see a glorification of the food truck. You see a lot of people, a lot of famous chefs have pivoted over the years out of brick and mortar and switched over to a food truck model, kind of referring to the slide that we just went through there. It can be a bit more manageable when you don't have people inside of a building, essentially. So there's all different types of mobile food units. And a lot of people first think of the food truck. What we see a lot of also really depends on your business plan and what you're trying to do. And maybe a food truck isn't the right type of food service vehicle for you. Maybe considering a trailer, a hitch trailer that's built out, you know, a little roving kitchen that you can hitch to the back of a truck or a vehicle or something like that. And your carts, too. We see some really popular bike carts. Rebel Cheese Steaks, who was around um, Portland and South Portland, was a custom-built 
bike cart. Um, so hot dog carts too. We see all different types of mobile units. And I wanted to really introduce this idea to everyone interested in possibly opening a food truck to just kind of really consider what the costs are and how you even find a food truck or the type of mobile unit that you'd like to have. So there are new and used food truck, trailer, and cart dealers. With a quick Google search, you can find them in all 50 states. They're everywhere. So that's one option for purchasing your mobile unit. Some people are pretty savvy and want to do a custom build out or they buy something new or they buy something used. There's really no wrong answer there. But overall, when the motor, when the engine, the transmission of your vehicle is connected to your kitchen, you're actually looking at something that could also be relatively expensive. So, you know, somewhere with the, these, these are national average numbers right here, but a brand new food truck that you buy custom built from a dealer could run you almost $200,000. Um, you know, the actual cost, this 100,000 to the 175,000 that we reference here is an inclusive number to include the wrapping of the truck, the equipment of the truck, um, and the purchasing of the actual vehicle, but it doesn't include all of the other costs associated with opening a food business. The uh, packaging, your uh, upfront costs for your ingredients, your business liability insurance, and we'll talk more about that as we go on. Your used food trucks are going to be less expensive, but you know what we really need to consider with your food truck that's used is somebody selling that truck for some reason. And finding out what that reason is, is pretty important. Maybe they just didn't wanna have the business anymore. That's one thing. Maybe there's something wrong with the vehicle and maybe you're gonna inherit someone else's headache. So doing extensive research before you buy a used truck is just as important as the vehicle you would drive with your family in. You know what I mean? You gotta do some research there. Um, leasing a food truck, there's options for that. I don't see too much of that happening in Maine. There's a few places that that can happen, um, but there are leasable options out there if you dig around a bit. And um, that can run between like two to $3,000 a month, generally speaking. Trailers and carts are not as expensive as food trucks because you're separating the vehicle from the kitchen, essentially. But something that's important to consider when you're trying to figure out what type of mobile food unit is right for you, essentially, is how much space, you know, you have to think about where are you going to sell your food? Because if you have a truck that's hauling a trailer, you're going to take up two parking spaces in a public vending scenario. So you have to, you know, there's some pros and cons, some things to balance when you're trying to understand and decide what the right mobile food, uh, food unit is for you. So I put together this kind of general order of operations. This is something that, you know, to consider, something to think about. Um, it's no two business plans are exactly the same, but this is just kind of an overarching view of get, taking your concept, the idea of having a mobile food unit to selling food, essentially. So what you first should really do, as I've emphasized already here a couple of times, is research, research, research. People don't necessarily, my mom always said to me, people don't uh, plan to fail, they fail to plan. So what you really need to think about before you start spending $200,000 on something is, you know, what are you offering? What is your menu? What services are you going to offer to your customer? You know, have some idea of that. Um, you need to identify your equipment. You know, once you start to piece this all together, there's no one decision that's made first. Maybe you have to think about a lot of different things at one time in order to come up with an idea for how this all moves forward. So these are some things to consider your equipment, sourcing your ingredients. Where are you going to be buying? You know, if you've got a pizza food truck, where's your flour coming from? Where's your yeast coming from? Things that you need to research and find out. 
Um, what type of mobile unit are you going to be purchasing? Finding a commissary kitchen to have a relationship with. Fork Food Lab is Maine's largest commissary kitchen, but we're right now in the process of helping six other commissary kitchens open in the state of Maine. So we're not the only option for people to choose from. There's going to be an option closer to you wherever you are in Maine. Um, getting your truck wrapped. You know, you see the fancy designs on the on the trailers and the trucks, you know, finding a designer and someone to actually make that big sticker and apply it to your truck with your logo on it and maybe your business phone number and how to get in touch with you in a QR code, identifying what that looks like, developing that design and finding the person to wrap it. That's some research that needs to be done. Sorting out your vending locations, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes, um, but really starting to figure out, you know, do I want to be someone that just does private events, catered events, corporate events? Do I want to go to fairs, festivals, or do I want to park on the street somewhere. A lot of people are familiar with what used to happen on the Eastern Promenade, um, you know, I think even up until last summer. So, you know, sometimes there's some almost like food cart pods. I lived in Oregon for a long time and food cart pods were absolutely everywhere. And that's something I'm gonna try to bring to Fork Food Lab as soon as we get our event space zoned in the city of South Portland. We think it's really important for people to to understand mobile food units and that you can have an incredible meal coming out of a food truck. Not all incredible meals come out of restaurants. Um, the other thing <laughs> that you need to consider once you've done some research is putting all of that information together, creating your general costs. What are your fixed costs? The things that are going to reoccur all the time. What are your variable costs? The things that might come in and out and change day to day, week to week, month to month, but really starting to generate an idea of your costs is incredibly important. Um, and then completing for everyone who wants to open a food business in the state of Maine, you need to get a food protection management certificate. The most popular one of those is called ServeSafe. Maybe some of you have heard of it, but there's a lot of competitors. And over the past few years, Fork Food Lab has become a little bit disappointed in the quality of the curriculum with associated with the serve safe program so we've been recommending an alternative to serve safe and i've included that link on the last slide in this workshop to uh, achieve that course and proctored exam so once you've done all of your research you know this is a general idea there's going to be some specific stuff for your business that i didn't include on this list um, then you're going to develop a business plan some people that can help you develop your business plan would be maybe a SCORE mentor. Um, working with, we work a lot with CEI, Coastal Enterprises, the Women's Business Center. Um, there's, there's a lot of free resources to help um, future entrepreneurs identify and establish a really solid business plan. Um, when you work with CEI, sometimes when they prepare your business plan with you and help you through that process, what they're really preparing you for is financing and showing your business plan to a bank if you need to borrow money. So, you know, there's, there's a whole process to that whole thing. And CEI is an incredible resource with assisting people with that. So then you figure out if you need financing and you start to figure out, you know, what do I need for my legal filing status? Am I going to establish myself as an LLC, et cetera? So you get through some of the financing and the entity establishment. Then you start to execute your purchases, buying the truck, buying the equipment, figuring out your ingredients, wrapping everything, putting it all together. Then once you have that going and you're feeling comfortable and confident, that's a good time to start submitting your business license applications to the state. And maybe there's a secondary license depending on where your business is based out of. There's three municipalities in the state of Maine um, and they require a specialized license. Uh, so that's a, something that Fork Food Lab can help you clarify and understand uh, when you're trying to figure out how to open your food business.
Um, then you're going to register the unit. You have to go to the BMV just like you would a car. That also needs a sticker on it um, through the Department of Motor Vehicle. Um, and then from there, what did I put my little things here? You're going to schedule your health inspections. So when you're applying for your business license, what you're really doing is submitting a portion of the fee that you're sending to the state and the city um, to schedule a health inspection with wherever you're located, there's gonna be someone designated through the Department of Health and Human Services um, for your region, your city or your town. And they're gonna come check out the truck. The fire department's also gonna come check out your truck and make sure that you're safe to be on the road. And there's also public services. They're going to come check out your truck and make sure that your water is being sorted properly and that you have proper disposal for your gray water that you're collecting when you wash your hands in your truck. And then once you get through all that, you're ready to start making money and sell some food. So that's a little idea of the overview of some things to expect when you're getting ready to open a food truck. moving. Sorry, you guys. Give me one second. Oops. There we go. Some challenges to consider. So, you know, you just saw the, the order of operations, essentially. It's a lot of work. It takes time. So before you really kind of get even through that whole process, other challenges that you should probably consider before you just go and spend a lot of money on this is all of what we have listed here, weather. This past summer, for example, was very challenging for anyone who did outdoor vending. We saw that at Fork Food Lab with a lot of our seasonal mobile food units and catering companies. If you remember, at least down in Southern Maine, the first half of this summer was an absolute washout. Every weekend, every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, which are typically the biggest money-making days for all food service establishments, were rained out. And what we're seeing now as we're winding down from the summer and moving into fall, you're seeing a lot of people that own mobile food units trying to figure out how they're going to recover the funds that they lost earlier in the year. None of us have a crystal ball. You know, the Farmer's Almanac is great. I use it, you know, but it's not going to give you 100% guarantee of what's going on with your weather that day. So what you really need to think about from a 365-day perspective is if I lose three months of my vending season to rain, what am I going to do? You have to be able to be prepared for fixing those financial problems when there's elements that you cannot control. There's also seasonality. Um, you know, what we see up here is a lot of people, well, before the pandemic, we saw a lot of people um, shutting their trucks down basically after like Indigenous People's Day and then in October and then really opening back up April, May, you know, mid to late spring. Then the pandemic happened, everyone was in dire straits, and we saw our mobile food unit and catering companies really start to expand the services that they were offering, offering, which allowed them to expand their operating schedule. So what used to be an October through May season has been evolving into something that looks a little bit more like March to November sometimes December even. If you recall last winter, the snow showed up very late in Maine. So we had people operating mobile food units well into January last year. So starting to think about your seasonality and if you want to take some time off in the winter or if you're going to run through the winter or if you can't afford to run through the winter, how are you going to provide a service for somebody or things that you need to consider? Preparing for winter, getting your truck winterized is also 
it's something you need to consider and really think about. Uh, when we see some people, especially buying used food trucks, it becomes a bit more of a challenge to winterize those vehicles. And we see people really looking for a covered garage. So if you're gonna have a food truck that you're not gonna operate through the winter, where exactly is that going to go? We notice a lot in Southern Maine, people rent, you know, we have people living in apartments and renting homes and things like that. Typically landlords are not a fan of having a food truck in their driveway or backyard. I am a personal recipient of experiencing that. <laughs> so, you know, you have to come up with a solution before you invest all this money and where exactly the truck's going to go in the winter. Maintenance. When your engine, when your transmission, when your oil is all connected to your kitchen and the equipment, if you have a motor blow in your truck, you're out of business, which is why some people really start to consider opening up a trailer rather than a truck. By separating the kitchen from the motor, you can actually still generate business even if your vehicle dies. Um, you can go rent a truck somewhere and still go out and make money that day. When they're combined, you can end up with some pretty serious challenges. We've seen it all around here at Fork Food Lab. And when your food truck's down for two or three days, that can be detrimental to your business plan. Um, so finding the other challenge with food trucks specifically is finding someone to even do the maintenance on it. That's something that we've been really struggling to find around here. If you do find someone who does work on food trucks, they usually hate doing it. So they charge you a lot of money to do it too. Um, this is all things that we've been trying to solve around here in this community of like-minded businesses that have come together. Um, so finding a good maintenance person to even work on the truck is also a challenge. Um, it's important to remember that when you are in a metal box, that you are in a toaster in the summer and you're in an ice box in the winter. So if you are going to be running a business year round, and we're, we see a lot of people definitely doing that in the summer, you have to really consider how hot are the temperatures you can withstand um, when figuring out if including an air conditioner in your unit is something that you need to have um, in order for you to be successful and stay awake throughout the day and keep it safe for not only you, but also whatever maybe employees you might have. Also figuring out if you are going to run in the winter, how are you going to stay warm in there? Um, so those are things that could be challenges for people. Um, what do we have here? This is the last one. It is physically grueling to work in any aspect of the food service industry, whether you're in a brick and mortar restaurant, bartending, catering, mobile food units, it is physically demanding, it's long days. And it's also even longer when you own the business because you're in charge. You have to do the ordering. You need to train your employees. You're running your books. You're talking about, you know, 12, 13, 14 hour days sometimes, maybe even longer. Um, so it, that's, that's a very important challenge to consider. Some people dive right, we've seen it happen. Some people dive right into mobile food units. And then like five months later, six months later, they're like, I'm selling this. I can't do this anymore. I'm so exhausted. So very, very, very important to consider these things before even diving into this. There we go. So where can you sell food in Maine with a mobile food unit? There's a couple of different options, basically. Um, when you're developing your business plan, you know, it's one thing to have a menu. It's one thing to do all your research, secure the purchase of your truck, get it all up and running and started. And the most important thing really at the end of the day is how you're gonna make money and selling the food. 
So when you're figuring out your business plan, you want to identify how exactly you're going to be selling food. So when you have a mobile food unit, there's public property options. I already mentioned the Eastern Promenade. Um, that's a very, that was a very popular space for mobile food units to just pull right up first come first serve. There would be 30, 35, 40 food trucks up there. It was great community. That's all evolved now. And I'm going to chat a little bit more about this when I get through this list, but there's public property options. Um, you would find out what those public property options are by talking to your city or town hall. They're the ones that are going to tell you where you can park on public property. Um, there are still some cities that don't allow zoning. They're not even zoned for mobile food units, such as Scarborough and Freeport. Uh, just the other day, someone took their food truck up to Main Street Freeport and got kicked out of there in like less than 10 minutes. So there's some places that still haven't really come around to food truck culture and don't want it in their city or town. So it's important for you to figure out where you're going to sell food if you're going to do it on public property and if that city or town even allows mobile food units to be there. Private property. There are some unique circumstances. Um, for example, there is a bar in Portland, Maine. It's called the Portland Zoo. And they have their liquor establishment, but they don't have a food option available for their customers. They operate their bar out of a shed. And then they have a really big patio in the back. So what do they do? They get a food truck or a mobile food vendor to come over and basically do a residency every summer. Or maybe they do some stuff that changes out among different food vendors. But sometimes when you're, use, when you're on private property, what you're really doing is you're making a relationship with an existing establishment that needs to solve a food problem that they're having. And it's usually associated with a beer, wine, or liquor license. We see this happen. One of our members at Fork Food Lab, the Greeks of Peaks, they parked a truck out on Peaks Island with on the lawn of the American Legion out there because the American Legion couldn't find the labor to run their kitchen that they already had at that facility. And the Greeks of Peaks needed a place to park the truck to sell food. So that was a great relationship that worked out for them. So some people explore the private property route um, with, with when they're opening a food truck. There's also the people that go around to different events, different festivals, different fairs, private stuff all over the place, the corporate events that I mentioned earlier. And what you're really ultimately doing when you're getting into your private event world and traveling around to different places is maybe you're treating some of those gigs like catering events. And what all mobile food units can really do with their state licensing once they're all set and ready to sell food is offer catering services. We see food trucks at weddings all the time. You can prepare to know that 200 people are going to be at an event, prep all of your food in advance, bring the truck over, have coolers with all of your backup food items, and execute a large private event for people. Going up to the Freiburg Fair, that is a huge revenue boost for so many people that go up there. People travel from all over the country to park their mobile food vending options up there. So, you know, there's, there's many, many different options to consider when you are opening a food truck. Now, there are over 400 food trucks registered in the state of Maine right now, mobile food units, I'll say. And at, down at Fork Food Lab, we have a really high concentration of people who call us that are mobile food vendors that need a legal commissary kitchen, regardless of where they live or where their business is really based out of, a lot of people still want to come down to Portland. As Maine's largest city, 
people see what goes on around here with the tourism, with the cruise ships. It's cruise ship season right now. There's a lot of money that gets spent down in Portland, and a lot of people want to get in on that. What's been happening in Portland over the last couple of years is a choke hold on the options for mobile food vendors to even have a place to park on public public property. Um, the city of Portland, what used to be up on the Eastern Promenade, a space for 30 or 40 food trucks to pull up, bring people together and have an iconic place to have lunch on a beautiful day. You know, one of the most beautiful promenades in the United States. They took that opportunity away from mobile food units pretty recently. And now the way this all operates on the Eastern Promenade is a lottery system that is, you know, someone at City Hall, uh, you put in an application, they're randomly selecting eight businesses. It went from a thriving economic situation to something that now only services eight specific businesses and on top of that, it used to be a free service for uh, mobile food units to go and park up there. Now there's a $4,000 fee associated if you're awarded that lottery permit for parking on the Eastern Promenade. Um, so it's evolving over time. And what we see and always need to remember and consider is that mobile food units do in fact compete with restaurants. And the restaurant lobby in the state of Maine has a lot of money invested in making sure that restaurants stay successful and keep a comfortable distance from brick and mortar restaurants with your uh, food trucks. So if you're thinking about buying a mobile food unit, starting a business like this, and your intention is to come down to Portland, I encourage you to go to the business licensing website for the city of Portland and find the document about where mobile food units can park. I'll send it to Dan and we'll include it uh, when we send out everything else here. I didn't put it on the helpful links and resources. Um, but it's, imp it's important to know if your plan was to come down to Portland, which I hear so many people trying to do, you really need to identify, is it a viable option based on where the city will allow you to park now? Wanted to just kind of throw that out there for food for thought. So now the next slide is our helpful links and resources. If I will ever get to it, here we go. I'm sorry, your legal uh, requirements. You need to identify how you're going to be a legal entity, whether you're opening an LLC, S Corp or B Corp. We have a few mobile food unit members at Fork Food Lab that have evolved into S Corps and B Corps um, because they have food trailers and there's a tax write-off for the vehicle that hauls the trailer, um, depending on the weight of the vehicle and the weight of the trailer. Um, so doing some exploration and some research about what the right entity entity is for you is important. Um, getting a food protection management certificate. A lot of people that come from the food service industry have a food handlers certificate. That's a three-year certification. The one that you need as a business owner is the five-year management certification. And I've included a link to uh, one that we recommend. You need business liability insurance. The link that I included um, on the next slide is a recommendation for the Food Liability Insurance Program of Maine. For shorthand, we call it FLIP. And something that we've seen, unfortunately enough, is when you already have home insurance or car insurance, and you just want to say, I only want to write one check. I don't want to have multiple people that I'm spending money, uh, sending money to for insurance. What we ultimately find out about your Liberty Mutuals, your progressives, your state farms, is they give you for your mobile food unit insurance, business liability, you end up with a higher premium and minimal comprehensive coverage. So we recommend the Food Liability Insurance Program of Maine because they give you a competitive rate and very comprehensive coverage because they're food industry professionals. We saw someone have an accident on their truck. They were going through, I think, State Farm. And State Farm didn't include any of the equipment 
in the policy that was developed inside of the truck. It just insured the truck itself. So you want to make sure that anything that's of value to your business that is required for you to operate is insured. So we, we recommend going with someone who specializes in food business. Um, finding a relationship with the commissary kitchen. You know, Fork Food Lab is a really popular option for people. We have all the space now. We've added and upgraded a lot of the amenities and services that we can offer for mobile food units, including parking, overnight secured parking with an electrical hookup. That's huge for businesses. Um, but we're not the only option. There's a lot of different types of um, spaces that are licensed kitchens that can act as your commissary kitchen. Sometimes it's a church kitchen. Sometimes it's your local VFW hall or American Legion. Sometimes there's a restaurant. Maybe if a restaurant's closed two or three days a week, they'll allow you to use their ice machine, trash compost and recycling, gray water disposal, fats, oils, and grease, dish machine, you know, there's a lot of things that food trucks need, but a fork food lab isn't your only option. There's a lot of different options out there, but you need to find a relationship before you even get this started. You got to get your vehicle registered. Like I mentioned, you need to, what you end up doing um, is you file a business license through the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, you send a check and an application with a lot of information up to Augusta, and that is predominantly... Um, the last stop for businesses in rural areas. I mentioned earlier the three municipalities in the state of Maine, it's Lewiston, Portland, and South Portland. If your business is based out of one of those three places or your commissary kitchen is in one of those three places, you're also going to need a municipal business license. And then sometimes if your business is registered in a town or a city, but you want to travel to another city or town to vend food, you're going to need a temporary event permit from that city or town that you're going to go vend in. And then we have our links and resources. We put the SCORE uh, link in here. If you're here, you know about SCORE. Um, SBDC is a vital resource for any small business development. CEI, like I mentioned earlier, Fork Food Lab. Not only are we a legal commissary kitchen, we provide storage and manufacturing space, we're also a food business incubator. We can help provide you and uh, provide you with support and connect you to the right people to make sure that you have a sound and solid business plan before you get started. Legal Food Hub is a free service. Um, you submit an inquiry and it's a team of people, team of lawyers that specialize in food business um, and they can provide you with legal answers. Food Liability Insurance Program of Maine, that link's in there, a link to the Food Protection Management Certificate. And I also included the, there's a state document here. I don't know how to get back to it now. There's a state document here that I included. It's called the Mobile Eating Place Operator's Guide. It's a manual that the Department of Health and Human Services put together. Anyone is free to access it. We'll make sure that you get the link. Um, when this is all sent out, but it's an incredibly useful manual. If you have no idea what you're doing and you want to find out what you're doing, read that manual. That's all I've got for you folks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corinne. That was a, a ton of really helpful information. Uh, I think it's a great uh, first part to our three-part series. I just want to remind everyone that uh, the second part is next Wednesday at noon, where we're going to cover uh, funding and scaling your food truck or mobile unit. And uh, it's a direct extension from here. We're going to have a, a banker from Gorham Savings come in and talk about what it looks like to actually get a business funded and, and move from food truck to brick and mortar, as well as a uh, an expert who has helped scale businesses from food truck to brick and mortar. So I think it'll be a really good one. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, we have about 10 minutes for Q&A. Please feel free to submit questions to the chat window or use the Q&A window, and uh, I'll pitch them to Corinne and we'll get started. And uh, just to get started with a question, uh, you kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, Corinne, but uh, one of the things when we were originally talking about this workshop that really struck me as a, a fantastic uh, thing to keep in mind, and especially 
uh, when food truck seems to be the really big thing that people talk about is that difference between food truck and mobile unit and how uh, there's a lot of liability attached to just having an engine attached to your kitchen. Uh, would you mind like touching on that a little bit? I just wanted to make sure we uh, we covered that point. I think it was a really good one. Yeah, absolutely. So to elaborate, you know, um, if you're opening a, biz a business, uh, regardless of what it is in the food service world, things that we already know before we walk into this is that you're in a totally volatile, basically unpredictable, high risk, low reward industry. And, you know, what a lot of people use mobile food units for is proving a concept. They want to be, if, if your dream is to open a restaurant, starting with a food truck or a mobile food unit is a really great, great way to prove your concept. What you ultimately need to do is focus on generating as much money as possible. And so when your engine is attached to your kitchen like this, you can really end up with some devastating losses. We've seen it happen where, because it's such a challenge to not only find replacement equipment for the motors in these certain types of vehicles, um, finding the people to even do the maintenance, and then the cost associated with making repairs in addition to the loss of business, sometimes having a food truck and experiencing, you know, a big repair problem can be the end of your business. Um, and it's really unfortunate when you see that happen. So, you know, when you see these people spending $200,000 on a food truck, it's because they are making sure that there are no major unpredictable issues that are going to happen when that motor is attached to um, the kitchen, which is why, you know, when people come to Fork Food Lab and they say, hey, my dream is to open a food truck. I see them on TV all the time. I'm, I really encourage people to think about, you know, if you already own a truck, if you have a vehicle that can haul a trailer around, um, consider a trailer. And maybe even a trailer's too big sometimes. You know, we're working with a gentleman right now who's starting a taco stand, and he has this cart with a griddle on it and some hot holding, um, uh, some hot holding uh, spots on the side of it. The thing weighs maybe 800 pounds, and he can haul it around with the Camry that he drives. So, you know, if you're really just walking into food business and your dream is a food truck, you know, think of, there are actually steps that businesses, future entrepreneurs can take before you even get to the food truck phase. Sometimes that's the final step in a business plan for people, not the first step. Um, but there's really no wrong answer. It's just very critical to really understand and make sure that you have, you can solve all the problems that are potential to be presented to you uh, when you have a food truck. Oh, Dan, you're muted. Sorry about that. We just got a question in here from Harry. I think a really good one. Uh, is there any B2B work done within Fork Food Labs? I'm planning to open a more beverage focused operation and was wondering if there's a way to partner with other food service providers to purchase some food items for the business. Can you just repeat the first part of that before beverage? Yeah, he, uh, Harry had said, is there any B2B work done within Fork Food Labs? Gotcha. So, the, you know, if you are in, there's no wrong answer at Fork Food Lab. Part of the challenge of our business model is we never know who's going to call us up and say, hey, I have this human consumption business food idea, whether it's beverage, food, you know, whatever. We don't know who's going to call us. So we can always work that stuff out. Not something I could give you a definitive yes or no answer on right now, but I'd be happy to um, explore and talk and learn more about what your vision is and start to cultivate a plan that could work for you. That's part of what we do in the, with the business incubation services down here at Fork Food Lab. Um, if you want to go to our website, I included the website in the helpful links here. We have um, a, a member inquiry form. If you're interested in learning more about Fork Food Lab or you're interested in 
finding more resources and maybe going through the incubation program, or you need to jump right into manufacturing. That's how you let us know. And that's how I give you a call back. Uh, I have another really great question here from Harry. Uh, are there parking limitations in Portland the same for a full-size food truck or a smaller cart or trailer? And uh, what considerations uh, should you have when, when thinking about parking, when you're uh, thinking about a food truck or trailer? So when you, let's clarify what a full size food truck is really quickly. Um, the smallest food truck that we have, even just at Fork Food Lab is 12 feet long. And the longest one is 33 feet long. So a full size food truck could be a subjective definition. And, you know, basically what you need to consider for the city of Portland is the actual size of a parking space. So with if you have a 33 foot food truck, you're going to take up two, two and a half parking spaces. So the city of Portland might not even let you park that on the street. Um, you might need, you might be limited to only certain spaces, like Deering Oaks Park is a space that can fit two food trucks. The Western Promenade can take two or three food trucks um, that don't have metered parking associated with them. So, you know, there are some limitations. You basically want to think about what, how, how are you interfering with the potential for people to walk into restaurants and be tourists here. They need to maximize their parking in the city of Portland. So based on the size of your truck, maybe there's some limitations there. Um, when you are applying for the municipal mobile unit license through the city of Portland, there are a couple different boxes you have the option to check off. One of those is for carts. So the city of Portland understands when you're applying to sell food there publicly, do some public public vending, you have to provide some details about who you are, what you're doing and what your mobile unit is. Um, and then, but they know they're aware. So they have other spaces that are maybe easier for carts to park at, or, uh, you know, carts can have a little bit more flexibility. For example, depending on the size of your cart, sometimes you can even end up on a sidewalk in the city of Portland. Not all of it is necessarily on the street. Um, so it's worth looking into because there are some nuances to each individual type of mobile food unit. I think that's a good yeah. Uh, we see, or I'm, I'm in downtown Portland and we see like uh, hot dog carts, for example, right. on sidewalks all the time. Right. I think we have time for maybe one more question. And one question that I did have, uh, and you kind of touched on a little bit, is uh, food sourcing. Uh, are there any resources that uh, Fork might be able to provide in regards to food sourcing if someone's just getting started? Sure. So, you know, the, the, before you can even start to identify how you're going to source your food, you need a menu and, you know, sourcing your food can be a tedious process. So I used this pizza example earlier. We see some pizza mobile units around here, but as we all know, no two flowers are the same. So if you have a dialed in recipe that you've been working on at home or in a different type of setting or environment, and it's with one type of flour, you know, finding that in a wholesale portion might be a challenge. And maybe there's a trial and error that needs to happen. Maybe you have to try what if, the, if like the product that you're using when you develop your recipe isn't available in a wholesale form, you're going to have to find a solution for that. Because when, as you open a business and as you're scaling up and as you're making more food for more people, you're buying food from wholesale distributors. You're not paying taxes on it because your taxes get passed off to your customer. That's why it's really critical for businesses to have a legal commissary kitchen so you can receive wholesale delivery orders from your wholesale distributors. They Cisco doesn't 
drop off food at your apartment. They need a licensed business to drop stuff off at. So if you want to access, you know, you waste so much money when you buy your ingredients at Hannaford, when you're spending money on the retail price. So once you have a menu developed, then Fork Food Lab has some internal resources that we can provide some support with to start to identify where you might find your ingredients, but most importantly, establishing a ballpark cost for those ingredients. Thank you so much, Corinne. Uh, looks like that gets us to one o'clock and I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we'll send out a recording of this webinar after uh, probably here in a few hours, as well as uh, a link to the slide deck and all the different resources that we've talked about today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week at our scaling and funding uh, food truck to brick and mortar event. Thank you everyone and I hope you have a great day. Thanks again, Corinne. Thank you. Bye, everyone.